Two, actually, two passages of Scripture. One is Second Kings, uh, chapter 25, uh, and it reads like this. Now it was the seventh day of the fifth month in the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he burned down the temple of Jehovah, he burned down the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house burned it with fire. And the army of the Babylonians who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Then the remaining, remaining people who lived in the city along with those who had fled from the king of Babylon and the rest of the multitude, the captain of the Babylonian army carried away into exile, though left some of the poorest of the land to 
to be vine dressers and to plow the fields. And the second reading is from the Psalms, Book of Psalms. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung our harps. And there our captors demanded of us songs, and our tormentors demanded mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's songs in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. May my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Sticky stuff we've got to deal with. Uh, okay. The event called the Babylonian exile is this watershed moment in the development of um, the religion of Israel. It's, it's actually what gives rise ultimately to what you and I think of when we think of Judaism. This is the beginning of the project uh, that becomes rabbinic Judaism. And it's an answer to a question, how do we sing the Lord's songs in a foreign land? So you, it, it's important to understand this thing. Now, because we always talk about the Babylonian exile in a kind of singular way, um, it, it, it's it not actually that singular it took place, the, 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 sort of ex, the exile itself took place over a period of time uh, because what happened was the, the Assyrians had been the major dominant empire in the 7th century. And they had, they had uh, eventually conquered and wiped out the northern tribes, the 10 tribes up in the north. But Judah had managed to hold out, and, and the w part of the way it held out was so, you know, when you watch a movie and a, a, a city gets sieged, besieged by the big army, and then there's always the big siege engines, and there's always this long, drawn-out process. That's not usually how it went. Usually what happened was the army would come and surround the city, and then there'd be a negotiation which boiled down to, how much money um, do we pay you for you to go away? That, it, it, was, a, it was a shakedown, that's what it was. Um, because, you know, let's be honest, people... The, the problem with war is no matter how bloodthirsty you are, there's still a chance you're going to get killed. So you kind of don't want to do that if you can avoid it. And if they're going to pay you money, so much the better. So they would arrange these, these tribute arrangements where um, nations, smaller nations, would become client states of these larger empires. And so Judah became a client state of Assyria. And then the Babylonians came along and uh, wiped out the Assyrians, defeated the Assyrian Empire, and so suddenly Jerusalem was looking at Babylon. So yeah, there was some argument about how they should solve this problem. Some people thought they should side with Egypt against Babylon because Egypt was the other major empire. Some people thought they should side with Babylon. Um, uh, there actually ended up being um, a, a period of time where Israel said, okay, here, take some money. <laughs> and became a, a client state of Babylon. And during that period of time, that was the first piece of the exile. There were, I don't know, 10 or 20,000 people who got removed from Jerusalem. This is top echelon people, uh, people with government skills, people who could read and write, uh, people with some financial resources, along with lots and lots of money, removed from uh, Jerusalem and brought to, to Babylon. Um, so by the way, I, I have a tendency to shorthand this. The nation, the, the Babylon, it, the Babylonian Empire is technically called Babylonia, and Babylon refers to the capital city, which today we would call Baghdad. So this is, uh, so there was that, and then there was, uh, then the king in Judah decided that maybe it was better to throw in with the Egyptians, and there was some more fighting, and more people got exported, and then and there was a third cycle of this, and so this piece I read to you today refers to the final, sort of the end of it, in 588 B.C. This happens in 588 B.C., and the, and the nation, of the Babylonian army comes and destroys Jerusalem, utterly wipes it out, just flattens the, the, uh, the walls, destroys the temple, and, and the destruction of the temple is this, this crisis moment. And they, because they go into the temple, they rip it apart, they take everything of any value, right? The Babylonians go into the temple and they rip everything out. They pull out the, the most famous artifacts like the lampstand, the bronze, um, 
lavers, you know, everything. And, and the temple itself had these big bronze pillars. They cut them up for easy transport, and everything goes back. Everything goes back to Babylon. Now, um, we don't have any reference here to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, as near as we can tell, has already disappeared from the story. So you remember the Ark, right? Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? The re whole reason you have the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark is because no one actually knows what happened to the Ark. It just disappears. From the, you know, it's there, it shows up in the biblical story, and then we just never hear any reference to it again. And so there's all these theories. There's a group in, um, in Ethiopia. Um, there's a church and a monastery in Ethiopia, and then they say they've got it, that Solomon sent it with the Queen of Sheba for safekeeping in Ethiopia, and that they've been guarding it for centuries. But they won't show it to anybody, so no archaeologist has had an opportunity to sort of check this out. But and then somebody else said the, the Knights Templars took it to Scotland. I don't know. Nobody knows where it is. Um, but everything else that marked the temple is gone. The temple is destroyed. The city is destroyed. And this, this is what creates the, it's actually called an existential crisis. This is what creates the existential crisis for the people who had been living in Judah because, th be because for them, their religion had been focused entirely on Okay, the ones who actually worship Jehovah, because remember, a lot of them didn't or had a kind of a flexible view of uh, religion and worship lots of gods. But the ones who worship Jehovah, and especially the ones who only worship Jehovah, were troubled by this because suddenly, how, what does that even look like? What does it mean to be a worshiper of Jehovah when there's no temple anymore, when there's no holy city anymore? That the temple was the spot. I mean, that's where the divine intersected with the temporal. That's, that's the one place in the whole world where there was the divine presence. And now, where's the divine presence? What does it mean? And this is what starts the question being asked. And so, as they begin to answer the question, how does one follow Jehovah? How does one sing the Lord's songs in a foreign land? And here in, in, the, in the book of Psalms, the word Lord actually is just a, a cover for God's name. It actually says Jehovah um, back there. That's what's behind it is Hashem, the name the, the four letters which designate the actual name of God hiding behind the, the translation Lord. So it's really how do we sing Jehovah's songs in a foreign land? This is the question that they're asking. And the rabbis begin to try to solve this problem. And, uh, and they keep working on it. And they have about, they, they, uh, the crisis is only going to last for them about 70 years. And then the temple will be rebuilt and rededicated. And then there'll be a temple again and the resumption of the, of the traditional style of worship and the animal sacrifices. But once the project has begun, the rabbis keep on it for about five centuries until the temple is destroyed again, this time by the Romans in the year 70 AD. And so by the time the Romans destroyed it, we have already constructed base, the, the foundation for what we think of today as rabbinic Judaism. And that's what survives. It wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for this event. So... So every modern Jew today um, it inherits, in essence, the, the question, the, the, the answer to the question that starts here in the Babylonian exile. I should mention that not everyone ends up in Babylon. A whole bunch of people fled the other direction, and they went to Egypt. And so what you end up with is, um, during the time of Jesus, there were three very important centers of Jewish thought and, and concentration of Jewish worship, religious worship. One was Jerusalem. And then the other two were Babylon and the city in Egypt called Alexandria. And there were, so these were the three main places where you had really significant Jewish communities doing really significant work. It was the work of the rabbis. But in terms of the work of the rabbis, the biggest work was being done in, in Alexandria and Babylon. That's where they were really doing it. Because in Jerusalem, there was the temple. Okay, so history lesson. What, what does that mean for us? We actually understand their experience. Okay? I mean, think about this for a second. How did they define themselves, those who worship Jehovah, how did they define themselves as worshipers of Jeho Jehovah? Who, who were they? Their definition has to do with the city of Jerusalem, the holy city, has to do with the temple, has to do with the sacrifices. Everything is connected to that. That's especially true for the priests, but it's true for anyone who regarded themselves as a follower of Jehovah. I mean, the prophets have been screaming, the idols are nothing, the gods of this world are nothing. And now 
there's only one God. And now the destruction of the temple implies that the one God has just been defeated by the nothing. And so this is a, this is a shattering, faith-shattering event. And, and what do you even do with that? And the reason why that's relevant to us is because you and I have the same kinds of experiences in our lives. I mean, think about how we define ourselves, right? If, if somebody says, well, tell me about yourself, what do you do? Well, you tell them about your work, right? You define yourself as student, as, you know, as, uh, as worker, as professional. I mean, I'm, everywhere I go, I'm, this is actually true, I'm either Pastor Tom or, or, or Reverend Tom. I mean, even my dentist. Okay, so not, not, not my dentist himself. He's like, hey, Tom, how you doing? I'm like, hey, Doug, I'm doing good. But when I get a call from the office to remind me about an appointment, they go, Reverend Tom, this is so-and-so from the dentist's office just reminding you that you have an appointment. Thank you, <laughs> Reverend Tom. Who will I be when I retire? Right? I mean, my self-definition includes preacher. Somebody says, who are you? You know, what, what are you? Part of my answer is preacher. You know, the, the list of things that I define by, uh, theologian, preacher, pastor, right? What happens when I'm retired? Where does that go? Or if something happened to me that prevented me from, like if I had a, an accident or a medical crisis, what if I lost my voice? Who am I if I can't preach? And it's not just what we do. It's not just our occupations. Don't we define ourselves also by our relationships? Uh, we, I mean, because we have, we have names for who we are. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. I'm a husband, right? So what happens when, some, when life tears that apart? What does that mean? What does a word like widowed even mean? Who am I if that word is the word that describes my experience? What, what does it mean if... You know, for a parent who loses um, their child, especially if, 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 if they've lost all their children. I mean, I know parents, right, who's, who have, in the course of their lives, had all of their children die before them. What word can they use to describe who they are anymore? If somebody says, who are you? You can't say, I'm a parent. What, what's happened? Uh, what does that look like? How do we do that? How, how do we describe ourselves? when these things occur. A and what happens on a more sort of individualistic basis when, when it turns out that we're not the person we thought we were? I'm thinking right now of Al Franken, right? You, I mean, so we've seen all of these uh, uh, women coming forward and going, no, really, uh, by, by the way, you know, the news treats it like a scandal. Oh my goodness, another woman has come forward with an allegation of inappropriate uh, and unwelcome harassing uh, behavior. And I don't know why they do that because every woman in the world that I've ever met goes, uh-huh. I mean, I won't even ask for a show of hands because I know it's 100% if I were to say, how many women here have experienced uh, inappropriate harassing uh, behavior? Every hand would go up. And then if I said, how many of you have e experienced unwanted you know, uh, sexual assault in the form of groping, touching, or grabbing, most of those hands would stay up. And if it went further and we started down the line, included things like rape, many hands would stay up, okay? This is, this is a reality of women's lives and has been forever. It's like men are the ones who are surprised. What? And so what you have is a guy like Al Franken who his whole identity of himself is he's a really good guy. He's, I mean, you have to understand, Al's from Minnesota. Al grew up with Minnesota nice. You betcha. So in his, you got to be nice to everybody. And all of a sudden, when it's something that he did, and it turns out, and it's right, there's a picture, and he realizes that I'm not nice. I'm just one more jerk male out there. What do you do with that? How do you, how, how do you deal with that? And now I use him as an example for you because he's in the news, but come on. Just all we have to do is look at ourselves. I mean, if you just, if you ever had that experience where you suddenly remembered something you did some years ago, and, you, and only now you look at it from the point of view of an adult, and you go, how, that was horrible. How could I have done that? Who am I? Who was that? That was me? I did that? That's awful. 
And so it all gets torn away. It all gets stripped away. I mean, and it, and it gets stripped away in two ways because there's nothing that we have that will not be taken from us. There's nothing by which we have defined ourselves that will not be removed from us. And the flip side that goes with that is that many of the ways that we've defined ourselves are, are lies that we've been telling ourselves because we haven't seen clearly the truth of us. And that's part of the message of when we talk about sin in our lives or brokenness is trying to be a little more honest about that stuff, looking at it and not defending it not going, oh, it's, uh, I can't believe this. I actually read this this morning, and I almost did a spit take. I was drinking tea. A pastor saying that women coming forward, that that was an attack on men. And that women, women are far more, they commit more sexual abuse than men. And I, I literally, steam is coming out my ears because, uh-uh, no, 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 no. The reason you hear about, like, the, the latest woman who is having an affair with her students is because it's so rare, not because it's so common. If, if a male teacher is um, caught having an affair with students, that's the local news. If it's a female stu teacher, it's the national news. The reason? Over 90% of all sexual assault is committed by men. It's a male problem. By the way, guys, if it's ever going to stop, we're going to stop it. Simple as that. In ourselves and in the guys next to us, by calling them on it, that's the only way it's going to happen. We have to stop it. What I want you to understand is that the longer we live, the more of how we define our reality is torn from us. And the more clearly we see ourselves the more we realize that the story that we've told ourselves about ourselves is not true, and we find ourselves wondering who we are and trying to figure out, is there some solid ground on which I can stand? Some place unmoved where I can define myself. And that's what we preach in the church. That's the message of Christianity. That God in Christ, by the blood of Christ, we are defined as children of God, as heirs of life, that we become God's people, and that nothing can change that, and nothing can shake that, and no matter what happens around us, that truth is unchanged. To define ourselves by the blood of Jesus at work in our lives, the grace of God at work in our lives, the love of God at work in our lives. This is how we find the solid ground because I know and you know that everything is going to get pulled from our fingers. It's just going to happen. That's the way this world works. But we can never be pulled from God's fingers. Jesus said no one can, you know, the sheep, not one of my sheep is lost. We cannot be taken from the hand of God. Our identity, who we are, comes to that. The answer to the question, how can I sing the Lord's songs in this foreign land, in this place I don't recognize anymore, the answer is because by the blood of Christ, I always stand in the presence of God. I am never far away. So this may be a, a, a land of misery and sorrow, a land of walking wounded, but the thing that will never, ever change is that I stand in Christ by Christ's blood. Can you find the prayer of response? Let's pray that together. I don't recognize this place, this exile I am living. It doesn't feel right. I don't belong. I don't fit in. I have become a stranger in a strange land, an alien in my own skin. How can I rejoice here? How can I give thanks under these circumstances? How can I sing the Lord's songs in a foreign land? Jesus, show me who I am when everything that I defined myself by is torn away. Show me how I am to walk, how I am to serve, how I am to worship, how I am to survive in a shadowland of brokenness and shame. Redefine my life 
by your blood, in your name. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Since I live. Burn. Mm-hmm. 